Howdy, everybody. It's Heath Robinson back again with the world traveler and phot- photographic professional, Joel Wolfson. Joel, are you there? I am here. How are you doing? I am doing very well. How are you? Good. Hello, everyone. Cool. Well, Joel is here to present Conquering the Challenges of Travel Photography. Okay, good. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I uh, always love doing these webinars, and I'm pretty excited about doing the webinar today for a couple reasons. Uh, first is I'm covering a subject uh, that I'm really passionate about, and that's travel photography. Uh, I'll get to the other reason in just a minute, but because I conduct uh, workshops, as Heath mentioned, in uh, different parts of the U.S. and worldwide, for that matter, most of my photography is done traveling. And I think many of us travel and photography um, goes hand in hand with that. And for some, that might be the only time that you shoot. And of course, with travel, there are particular uh, challenges that come along with it. The major one, I think, is constraints of time and schedule. So as carefully as we may plan our travel, uh, when we're limited on time in any one place, it means we don't always have ideal weather or time of day or even time of year. So I'm going to show you how I use adjustments as well as some legacy plugins from within studio to help me conquer these challenges. And I'll be showing you examples from both domestic and foreign travel. For me, that means the U.S. and outside the U.S. For some of you in other places, it's different. But uh, bottom line is just to show you some variety. Um, Also, because you get free updates, um, he said it was okay to tell you this, but uh, Topaz is going to be bringing batch processing to Studio very soon. Um, So anyway... Uh, keep an eye on that, and if you take advantage of the sale, you'll you know you'll get your free update. Uh, before I jump into the process uh, here, I just wanna I wanna mention that in addition to webinars like this that Topaz so kindly hosts, I also provide other opportunities for photographers in the way of articles, guest blogging, workshops, speaking engagements, reviews that I do, and a good part of that is all free. So the best way to find out about this is to subscribe to my newsletter, which I send out once or twice a month. Um, I'll just show you what it looks like uh, to sign up. This is You can sign up on any page on my website. This happens to be my For Photographers section, which is a good one to check out because I've got uh, a learning section, uh, archive of these webinars, uh, favorite links for other resources and that sort of thing. But anyway, on the left here, um, all I need is your first name and email address you pick the kind of uh, news you want to get. The workshop and photo news is probably the one that would interest most of you, but I also do some fine art stuff. Anyway, uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump into the processing. So my first uh, image here, this is an image in Death Valley, and it's in one of the canyons in the area. I was scouting for a future workshop, and I only had a few days to cover a pretty vast area and number of locations. And I was I was struck by a few things that made me stop and capture this image. So this is a, a scene of complements and contrast. So you've got the texture and the clouds up here, um, reinforcing the texture and the rock formations. Uh, you have complements of color with the blue sky and the oranges and reds in the rocks. And there's even this uh, little green bush down here that uh, is of course opposite on the color wheel from red and offers us another little aesthetic element. And then there's uh, of course this rather uh, dramatic natural frame with this circular road and these high canyon walls. And you know, naturally on this trip, I did my best to take advantage of some locations in good light, but this was one I was limited by schedule and I was shooting in less than ideal conditions. So let me show you where this started, uh, and then I'll show you how I got there. So this is is where I started. This is from the raw capture out of my camera. And you probably think that it looks dark. And what I did here is I exposed for the sky. Um, So the rest of this, except for a little bit over on the left here uh, that's in the sun in the background, Um, All of this rock formation and the canyon walls and the road and everything are all in the shadow of the canyon. The reason for underexposing it, and this is definitely something to keep in mind when you travel because we do run into these um, less than ideal conditions. 
is that I wanted to maintain the detail in the sky because those it, it's it's a critical part of the composition to have that texture in the sky, which sort of complements the texture in the rock formations. Had I exposed for the sky, or or I should say, had I exposed for the rocks so that you could see all the detail, then I might have blown out the sky. So with any modern digital camera, you have a pretty low noise floor. And what that means is that you can pull a lot of detail out. And with the better cameras, usually at least four stops without introducing noise. The problem is that the opposite is not true. So if you're if you um, blow out the highlights, there's nothing there to bring back. The pixels are at their at their highest value. If you're talking a um, 8 bit scale, it would like you see in Photoshop, it would be a value of 255 and, and there's nothing to bring back. So given a choice, you're better off doing it this way. Now, the question is, how do I get it back to look like the image I just showed you? And what I'm going to do, um, basically, we need some exposure equalization or exposure balance. And what I'm going to do is use one of my all time favorite plugins from Topaz called Adjust. And I kind of call it the uh, magic exposure balancer, a magic exposure equalizer. But uh, those of you that have been using Topaz plugins, um, you can you can access all of them right from within Studio. And those of you that have only used Studio, you can see in the menu up on the top here where my arrow is, the plugin menu. I'm going to go into Adjust Five here, and right from Studio, it'll just launch into the plugin. We're getting the the spinny thing here, so and I'm not sure why actually. Let's see. Okay, there it is. So it it um it looks kind of funky. What what happens is when you open a plugin, it defaults back to whatever you were doing the last time you were in there. So what I do is I go down in the lower right here. You see there's this reset button in the lower right of your screen. And I'm going to click on that, and that resets it to my initial exposure. So the layout on here is similar to um, the other Topaz plugins, as well as Studio, as well as a lot of programs out there, where you have a collection of presets on the upper left here, uh, the, the individual presets below that. Over on the right are your tools, and up above are sort of navigation and viewing related things. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm in the classic collection. If I uh, click on low key, um, that's pretty ugly, but <laughs> that's what it gives me. I'll do uh, equalize here. That's a lot closer to what I'm looking for. But what I'm going to do is show you how to get there with the adjustments so that you know how to do it. So I'm going to reset this again. Over on the right, you have a bunch of panels, and the most important one and the crux of this whole program is adaptive exposure. Underneath that is the adaptive exposure slider, um, and then something called regions. Those two are really the key to this whole program. There's a lot of other stuff you can do. I'm not going to show you all that stuff now because I could probably do a whole webinar just on this. But um, the adaptive exposure, like it sounds, it 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 adjusts exposure adaptively. As you all know. Um, if I were to just take a normal exposure slider and move it up and down, I'm going to be sacrificing either highlights or shadows. If I move it up to bring up shadows, I blow out my highlights and vice versa. So what I'll do is I'll bring up this adaptive exposure. And you can see already it's bringing up the shadows and, and it's actually adding a little more detail to the highlights. It's not where I want it, but that's where regions comes in. In fact, I'm going to slide regions down to one just so you can see the difference. Basically, what this does is it it the regions is how adaptive exposure looks at it and processes it. And right now it's treating the whole image as one big piece, one whole item. As I move the regions up, it's like you're overlaying a grid, kind of like graph paper. So, and then what the exposure does is it or sorry the adaptive exposure adjusts each one of those regions separately and then kind of melds them all together and it's it's really kind of magical so i'm going to move it up to about 20 here and that's <clears throat> excuse me that's a lot closer to how i want it now when you go much beyond 20 with the regions um, at least in this case it's diminishing returns um, i'll move it all the way up just so you can see 
it's it's a pretty subtle difference if you can even see it. So 20 is kind of my optimum in this case. And the rule of thumb is the higher the number you have on adaptive exposure, the more regions you're going to want to use. It doesn't work that way 100% of the time, but that's a good rule of thumb just to get used to this. Now, the other thing I want to do is add a little bit of saturation to this because it's very lackluster. And those of you that shoot raw know, um, and I always say this, is that raw is blah. Um, and there's a good reason for that. If, if if raw was contrasty and saturated, you would be losing a lot of detail. So by its very nature, it's it's pretty flat looking. So what I wanna do is bring back some of the color that I saw when I was there. I'll go to this color panel over on the right here. And you notice it has adaptive saturation and, and color regions. So it basically works the same way as adaptive exposure. So I am gonna bring up my um, saturation a bit, maybe 25 position here. And you can see it's bringing a lot of that color back, both in the sky and the rocks. It's kind of an overall thing. Um, what I'm seeing though is it's introducing some color into the part of the rocks that are gray and that's where the regions come in. It's much more subtle than you see the regions in adaptive exposure. Now I don't know how well you guys can see this, you know, going over the internet and everything, but um, the rocks right, right where my cursor is in the middle, the surface of the rocks is kind of gray. The red comes from all the red dirt that's kind of intertwined in the, in the rocks there. So um, this is pretty good, and this is a great starting point. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to tweak it in here because I have a lot of other tools that I can use in um, right from within Studio. So I say, okay, and what happens when you do that with a plugin is it should drop it right back into Studio with the adjustments you made. And if I scroll over to the right, on the lower right here, you see the blue outline. It's created a new frame, a new image from that original um, dark one that I showed you that we started with. So now we have a really great starting point to add some other stuff. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is bring up a basic adjustment. So over on the right here, we have adjustments. When you click on it, you can see what there is. The ones above the line, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, are the ones that come free with Studio, and Studio itself is free. Uh, below that are the pro adjustments, which you can purchase whatever ones you need. Uh, I guess with the 40% off deal, if you if you think that there's even half of them you need, <laughs> you're coming out a lot better to to buy the whole thing. So um, what I'm going to do here is um, uh, use adjustments, go to basic adjustment, and that's the one uh, that you're going to use quite a bit because you've got exposure, shadow, highlight, all that sort of thing on it. Um, Although it's a pretty good starting point, I'm, I'm just going to bring the uh, exposure up a little bit. <clears throat> it, I'm, I'm lacking a little bit of contrast, so I'm going to bring my black level down. Now, there's a couple ways to do this. I can just use the slider, or I can pick this dropper, go to an area in the image, for instance, at the base of this bush that should be black, and click on it, and it sets the black point. And you can see it it gave me just a little more contrast that way. I'm gonna bring it down even a little more um, just to get a little more snap. And I'm gonna bring my um, exposure up more too because this was brighter. I mean, our eyes and brains are magical. We can look at a scene like like our starting point on this where you have this dark formation in in, in the shadow of some canyon walls and your eyes see it more like this where you can see all the detail in both highlights and shadows and of course that's always our challenge when we're um, trying to process these things later so we are a lot of the way there but i'm going to do a few more tweaks on it now one thing i'm seeing and maybe you guys are too um, i'm going to zoom in so you can see over on the right here do you see the edge of this canyon wall where i'm running the cursor it's there's like a red fringe, and then right opposite that is a cyan greenish fringe. And that generally comes from chromatic aberrations in the lens. This particular lens um, didn't transmit metadata. If it does, a lot of lenses do. They'll, they'll embed data in your file. You don't see it, but uh, Topaz Studio does, and it'll automatically apply corrections. In this case, it's not, but that's no problem. I can go over to the lens in the lower left here, click on it, and just move, um, it says D fringe, so it's telling you what it does. And R is for red, so the red 
channel, which would be red in its complement, which would be green. And I just move that up and, and you'll, you can watch this just kind of disappear. So there I've corrected it. I got rid of that fringing uh, pretty quick and easy. So let's go back to processing this thing. Um, what I'm going to do now is let me get it back to the overall view. I want to <clears throat> I want to adjust these clouds and bring some some detail in there. And there's a couple ways to do this, but I'm going to show you a little trick that I like, and that is to use um, precision detail. Now, typically, we would use precision detail just as you expect it to. Um, bring some detail uh, back into the image or, or to heighten detail in the image. And that is what we're gonna do, but one thing I wanted to point out that a lot of people don't think about when they use this is um, there's this shadow button and this highlight button. So you can limit the detail to those values. So I'm gonna click on highlights and in this image, that's pretty much the sky and the clouds. So now I can go and adjust this and isolate it to the clouds without even using a mask. So um, typically with clouds, um, you're going to be using the, or I do anyway, the medium and the large detail. But if you look up here um, in this section of the clouds, there's a lot of fine detail. So um, I'm going to start with the small detail, and I'm going to move that up quite a bit. I think you can see some detail uh, coming back into these clouds here. And you can see there's... I've brought in a lot right up here, especially where there's the smaller detail in the clouds. And I'll bring up the medium detail too for the for the larger objects in the sky here. And um, that's looking pretty darn good. So what I'll do is if you want to see what it looks like before and after for a particular adjustment, on the top of your uh, pro adjustment panel, there are all these various buttons. And one of them is an eyeball. And I'll show you what the other ones are later. You You click on that and you can disable the whole adjustment. So that gives us a before. And now you should see the after. There's there's a little bit of delay there from what I see to what you see. So hopefully that uh, I time that properly. All right, so I've got my clouds. Now I just want to um, adjust my uh, color and saturation a little bit. There's a great adjustment for that called HSL tuning. And HSL tuning, HSL stands for hue, saturation, and lightness. So it's the um, essentially the color of the color, <laughs> the the, um, and that's the hue. And then there's saturation, uh, which we all know what that is, and the lightness, which is um, whether it's uh, dark or light. And you can isolate it to each color. And there's different ways to look at this. You can you can click on each of these hue, saturation, and lightness and see all the separate sliders. I like to use it this way with the color one highlighted, and that way I can just go to each color that I want and my sliders are below that. And when you hover over one of these colors, you can see those red hash marks across my screen. Basically, it's showing you where those colors are in the image, which is really handy. So if I go on red, which is predominant, it's, it's, you can see those hash marks through almost everything except the sky, and that's where we're gonna start. So what I want to do on the red is um, saturate it a little bit. Um, it was a little more vivid than this, so I want to bring that up. And this is pretty subtle, what I'm doing. And by, um, by bringing the lightness down when you darken a color, um, it also tends to, um, if you don't go too dark, make it a little more saturated. That's actually an old film trick. If you guys, any of you guys are from the film age, like me, back in those days when we shot Kodachrome or Fujichrome or whatever, we would underexpose a third or half a stop to saturate the colors. So I'll work on the sky now. So I'm going to click on the blue, and I, I, it's saturated enough, but I'm just going to use the lightness. So I'm just going to bring down the darkness, and that just makes it a little more evident um, without actually like super saturating it, because I want to maintain some sense of realism here. Um, trying to trying to get across the feel of what it was like to to be there. Then something else. This is another adjustment. Whoops, that I do to to almost every image, and that is to add. You want to add a sense of depth. We're dealing with a two dimensional image, and so we want to try to make that as three dimensional looking as possible. And one one really great way to do that is precision contrast. 
Um, and this is really cool because it, it divides the contrast into four separate areas that you can control um, rather precisely, hence the name. Uh, Topaz is pretty good at naming these things aptly. So I'm going to start with the micro contrast. And let me, you know, I'm going to enlarge this a little so you can see a little bit better as I as I make these adjustments. So I'll bring, now, now what this means, by the way, the micro contrast means there's very little difference from one pixel to the next. So in the areas, like whether it's a light blue against a slightly less light blue, it would accentuate that. Um, and, and it goes on up to high contrast. So um, I'm going to start with the micro contrast and bring that up just a little bit. I'm going to go to the around 20 is good. I'm going to go to the low contrast, bring that up about, and I'll do a before and after so you can see. And then the medium, I think I'll go up a fair amount more. Now, as, um, as you build contrast in these first three, sometimes, and in, in fact, in a number of cases, I might bring the high down to a negative number. I don't really seem to need it here. Um, it's it's blowing out a little in the sky, but um, uh, we'll take uh, we'll take care of that. So and and the way I'm going to do that, the way I'm going to handle the sky is just to take my highlight slider down so that I'm not blowing out those highlights and take that to a negative number here, and that that'll help me bring the detail back in the highlights. And then the only other thing I'll do is I'll, uh, you have uh, under color, you still have, uh, you have some other controls so you don't have to go say out of this and back to basic uh, adjustment. You can just do the saturation rate from within this layer and I'll, I'll bring that up a bit too. Now, um, <clears throat> you might be looking at this and saying, wow, Joel, that's really electric. <laughs> and it is, it's too much so. so um, the reason, my reasoning behind overdoing it is, um, is to get the right ratio in here, primarily in these three sliders, but I also adjusted the saturation. And then you can always go back up to this opacity slider. Every single one of these has an opacity slider, every adjustment, which is really cool. So now I can go back in and tweak it, and I am going to bring it down maybe to 50% roughly. And to me, that's looking a lot better. Now, let me, I'll click the eyeball here and turn it off. There, now you should be able to see that. And I'll go back to it, turn it back on. And there you can see the difference. So we are pretty much done here, I think. Let me go to the overall view. The only, the only little flaw I see right now is um, this bush was a lot more evident, a lot brighter green, and it was really, you know, it's not a big element, but it was just kind of cool to have that stand off against the red. So what I'm gonna do, and I'll be able to show you masking along with this too, because this program has great masking capabilities, is I'm gonna do another precision contrast. This one is gonna be, and you can do as many layers as you want um, with these adjustments. Each one comes up in its own layer on the right here. I'm going to do another precision contrast. I'm going to zoom in um, on the bush so you can see that. And so mentally, I'm going to ignore everything else and just concentrate on the bush. You will see, you will see all the rock and everything around it get really ugly before before I finish it. <laughs> so um, first of all, I'm just going to use the micro contrast because if you look at this bush, it's a lot of fine detail. And so I'm going to crank this up a bit, 45, 50, somewhere in there. And remember, I'm just, I'm just looking at what it's doing to this bush. Um, I'm going to bring, I'm going to go down here and bring saturation up pretty high here, just because it's pretty pale. Um, now I know, remember the red looks awful, but we're going to get rid of that in a second. I'll even bring, um, the vibrance up, that brings the less saturated areas up a little as opposed to the saturation, which is kind of overall. And I'm losing a little bit of the shadow in that bush. You remember that's where I set my black point before. So I can just um, go into the shadows up here under lighting, um, bring that down a bit, maybe 40-ish here. 
So I, I'm bringing a little contrast back to that bush. And it's the bush is mostly mid-tone, so if I want to brighten it up a little, I can just do that with the mid-tone slider. I'm not going to do a lot there. So now we need to isolate the bush because we have all that um, really gaudy, awful-looking color. So um, in case you didn't catch what I did here, I went up to, you see where there's a plus sign in these layers? Um, that's where your mask is. So if you click on that, it opens up your masking menu, and you can do all different kinds of masking. The first thing I want to do is go up here where it says invert mask when you hover over it, click on that. Now with masking, for those of you that aren't that familiar with it, uh, white reveals and black conceals. So this, what I'm looking at here is a little preview of the whole image and it's completely black, which means it's masking out everything I just did. I'm going to grab a brush just down here um, I want to make sure that I crank my transparency all the way to the white. I just click on the white button. You notice it went up to 100% here. I'm going to grab um, the brush. And I can control the size of the brush with this radius slider here. So I'm going to make it a good size for my bush here. And as you brush in, it gives you like a red overlay so you can see where you're brushing. Um, that green outline is my feather. And it's like a feather in any other tool in Photoshop or anything else. Um, and we let it process here. And voila, we have the bush back. And that's kind of our, our final adjustment here. Let me go back to the fit view. Um, and there we are. Pretty big difference from where we started. I'll, I'll show you that. There's where we started. And there's where we ended up. So pretty big difference. Um, and we had all these great tools, made it pretty easy. It took me a lot longer to explain it than it does for you to do it. And uh, I'll go on to the next image here. Fantastic. Thanks, Joel. Oh, you bet. So my next image. Okay, here's a bunch of rooftops in a town in Brittany in northern France. Um, it was lousy weather, and honestly, it was a battle looking for shots. I was intrigued by the forms and design and angles of these rooftops, uh, but I just couldn't find a great way to present it and, and get across the whole idea of, of those elements. You know, it might have been better if I had some direct light or, or sweet light, you know, golden hour light. But I didn't have any of that, and I didn't have time to come back, kind of a typical travel story. Uh, I knew in black and white that there would be way too much gray because the whole, the whole interest here are these rooftops. Um, and what makes them stand out, actually, is the warm tones in the stone houses and the greenery around it. You go to black and white, and the whole thing is just a bunch of gray. Basically, it needs to be simplified because there's just too much detail. It's very busy. Um, when I looked at this scene, I, you know, I, I thought to myself, wow, this would be great as a pencil drawing or a pastel to simplify things and get rid of all that busyness and the excess detail. Well, the problem is I have very few skills as a pencil or pastel artist, so topaz to the rescue. Uh, I'll show you where I ended up with this. I think you saw it in the uh, uh, preview slideshow. I'm a lot more pleased with this rendition than a detailed photo, and I'll show you how I got there. But one cool thing about Topaz that really nobody else has is they have all these artistic adjustments where it, it, it's not a photograph anymore. It takes it way beyond a photograph. Um, now, if I didn't know about these tools, I never would have even taken the shot because I just didn't like it at the time. But in my head, I was visualizing this in a different way. Um, if you look at my last webinar, which was on visualization, if you didn't see it, uh, I talked about some uh, ways to hone your visualization skills. But the whole point is, knowing you have these tools, that adds something essentially to your repertoire of visualization, where you can look at something and say, okay, I can't make a photo out of it, but maybe I can make a painting, maybe I can do something really funky with Glow or Restyle or AI Remix or one of these other ones. But let's go back to my starting point here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to make use of um, of a preset, let me bring my um, my uh, effects back here. So on the left, this menu is called effects, and effects are essentially um, combinations of adjustments. 
So you can do however many adjustments you want and save them off as an effect. Uh, you can share them with everyone else on Topaz by um, making it public. Just It's just a little switch to do that. Um, and you have all these ones built in that you have that you can make use of. And I'm going to make use of one of those right now. Um, I, I was searching on pencil. Let me start from scratch so I can show you. So if you click on the menu thing, you see all the different categories and effects, and you can do a search on one. So I was looking for something that's um, pencil and pastel. So if I type in the word pencil and hit the search thing here, it'll come up with everything with the word pencil in it. And what I'm looking for is one called pencil and pastel right here. All right, so if I click on that, what it did is, if you look over on the right, it brought up impressions. So it's actually only using one layer, one effect. Although that's a little bit deceiving because impression is almost like an entire program unto itself. All right, so this is actually a good part of the way there, but what I want to do is um, is is tweak this a little bit. So the main thing, it, it's a little too um, pencilish. I want a little more pastelish. So one quick thing I can do is click on the medium here, and that right away that um, it, it takes it, it increases the number of brush strokes and it makes it look slightly more pastelish, um, less pencilish if if these are even words. Um, and the other thing I might do, there's all these different adjustments, and, and I'm not going to go into all of that today, but um, I would say maybe the, um, I'm just going to take the, the stroke width and make it just a little wider. And what I'm going to do also is I'm going to click on the HD button up here, because that will show you what it looks like in a higher resolution. So that's actually a pretty darn good start, but what I want to do is tweak this thing. So one thing I want to do is adjust uh, the saturation and lightness of colors. I can do that. You saw um, we had that HSL tuning thing. There's one built right into under color. There's one built right into impression, so I don't even have to do a separate layer. Uh, I'm going to go um, to the greens first. And I'm going to decrease the saturation because they're kind of overwhelming um, the picture here. And you can see right away that brings brings those down, and it's already going part of the way to making the um, the rooftops and the houses more dominant. And I'm gonna I'm gonna darken those quite a bit too. We'll bring it down to roughly there. Um, the other thing is that there's um, there's a lot of yellow in greenery. That sounds funny, but when you trees and grass and all those things that we think of as being green actually have a lot of yellow in them. So um, I'm going to adjust that too. So I'm going to go on the yellow lightness here, and or on the yellow, and I'm going to go down to the lightness and just bring those yellow values down. And you can see the greenery darkening as I do that. So I'm going to bring it a fair amount down, and um, we're actually almost done now. You can see now that I've made these rooftops more prominent and I darken the greens, there's over on the upper left here, there's, um, I don't know, it's some kind of uh, tent or something. And and what I can do is just retouch that out. So when I go, to, when I go down here to the heel, um, it'll show me the photographic view and, and I can see up here, this is what I want to get rid of. I'm going to bring my brush size down just a little bit. So first, I'm going to get rid of these, uh, I don't know what those are, recycling barrels or something. And I'll get rid of this thing. And this does a really good job, even at a photographic level. You can hardly tell what was there before. But it's not even that critical because I'm doing a painting. So when I hit Done and it goes back to the painting, um, I'm rid of... I'm rid of those elements that were over here. So, so they were just kind of a little distraction. All I really have left to do here is kind of adjust my lightness values. Um, I'll go to uh, the tone curve. And that's one of the ones that comes with this. And all I want to do is, is darken these values a little bit. So I'll start on the shadows here. And it's kind of bringing the whole curve down. 
Um, wow, that's really good. So all I had to do is just kind of bring the values down a little bit here. And now those rooftops are really standing out. Um, the greenery, not so much. And if I want to accentuate that a little more, I can throw a vignette on here, which I'll do. Now, when I uh, when I do a vignette, what I like to do is is bring the strength all the way up because it allows me to see where the vignette is better. And then I can go in and adjust the size and transition if I want to. So um, I'll make... I'll widen the vignette. So as you go to a higher number, it, it moves the vignette out a little bit because I don't want to take off too much of the houses. Uh, the whole thing is about the rooftops. It's, it's uh, too much on the strength here, but maybe I'll uh, play with the transition. I'll go in the negative direction. So that just sort of wi widens that fall off a little bit. And then I'll bring it back to a more reasonable level here. So I think that's great. Um, I'll go to the compare mode. You can do that on the upper right here, um, and it gives me a left and right. Um, and then I'll I'll hit the fit button so that you can see the whole thing. And I'll go over on the left here and get rid of that. So there we are. Voila. We in in about you know five or ten minutes here we were able to convert this whole thing. So um, let me go on to the next image. And that one is here. You may have seen this. Here, let me get out of the compare mode. And I'll get my uh, presets back here. So um, this is a very well intact fortress in northern France. It was originally built around 1000 AD. Um, again, not the most cooperative weather. In fact, it rained much of the time that I was in this town. Um, I knew if I could use uh, black and white and kind of accentuate the drama in the sky, <clears throat> excuse me, it would really have uh, a timeless feel. And the, and the clouds kind of make the, the whole feel a bit more ominous, which is the feel you get when you're standing there looking at, at this imposing fortress that's been there for centuries. So let me show you where I started with this. Um, here it is, and and similar to what I how I handled the canyon, um, I didn't want to blow out the sky, so um, it's a lot easier to bring up the exposure in the shadows. If I lose the detail in the sky, it's never coming back. Um, so the first thing <clears throat> I want to do is a basic adjustment, and I'll uh, bring the exposure up a bit here. So maybe somewhere in here, 40-ish, um, is is uh, bringing that back up. But I also want to set a black point and a white point so that I get a little more contrast. Um, I'll go down here for the black. Now I'm looking for something bright that has some detail. Let me zoom in here. So this shutter over on the right, you can still see some detail in it, but it's a bright white. Maybe I could use that cloud up there, but what I'm gonna do is set the white point on this. There, now we have a lot better contrast, but you'll notice my sky got blown out. So uh, I'm gonna wanna bring that back. Now the next, next thing I'm gonna do is sort of an unconditional, I mean, uh, unconventional, um, use of this, but I'm going to use the um, the dehaze. Now, normally that is what you would think it is, and it's it's to reduce um, you know haze in the atmosphere. Or I've even used it with like um, you know fog and things like that. But what I'm going to do is use it as a shortcut to accomplish several tasks at once, basically to prepare the image for black and white. So those those of you that have seen me do black and white before know I recommend making your color image a little oversaturated and contrasty, essentially a little gaudy for color because that's generally what gives you a good starting point for black and white. Um, the other uh, the other thing dehaze will do is give us uh, some sense of depth. It's a bit like clarity on steroids. So as you'll see, it'll end up darkening the image too. But 
Um, readjusting exposure takes no time at all, and the dehaze ends up saving a lot of time overall. Um, it may not work on every image, but it's worth giving it a try when you're when you're prepping for uh, black and white. So I'm just gonna, and, and it's basically this one slider. I'm gonna bring this up quite a bit, right right to maybe the um, 70ish or so, and um, Now that I've done that, you can see the uh, that it's that it's kind of gaudy. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to my basic adjustment here. I just want to show you guys something. Here I'll turn. I'm gonna turn this off. That's what the little eyeball thing is. Um, I want to show you something because I, I promised you I'd show you some other masking tools, and this is a good a good place for it. So if you click on this plus sign. To add the mask, I did the brush before. That isn't too sophisticated. But what I want to show you is something that Topaz has that nobody else does. So I'm going to go to the the graduated filter, and if you notice um, in the graduated filter, there's a thing that says Edge Aware, and that's at 50%, which is probably a good starting point. So I'm going to snug up this. Um, the, the green and red are the transition points where it goes in and out of the um, it goes in and out of the the gradation but you notice it with this um, I'll widen it just a little bit here with this uh, option to do the edge aware um, if you look over on the right which is um, a miniature of my image showing the masking it just magically outlines everything um, along instead of if I turn that off here I'll show you I'll bring that all the way down then it's just a normal gradation but what's cool is with this edge aware thing and 50 is is a good place for it um, it just it it automatically masks out the sky so I'll close that and uh, we may go back to this layer later just to make some new adjustments one, once we get our dehaze in there so now that I've got now that I've got my dehaze in there, I'm going to go. I'm going to add a black and white layer to this. First, I'm going to go back up to the basic and and adjust my exposure. So the dehaze, um, one of the things it does is darkens it quite a bit. So I'll um, I'll bring my exposure back up here. Maybe yeah, that's pretty good. Something in the 60ish range there. And as you can see, that color is really gaudy, but but you'll also see, if you haven't watched me do this before, that that does uh, help for a black and white. Um, and and dehaze is the one that's doing that. If I turn off dehaze, you can see the difference. Um, but you'll see when we go to the black and white that that it, it really makes for a good black and white conversion. So um, what I'm going to do is add the uh, black and white layer to this. So I'll go to my adjustments, and I will go to where's my black and white right there. So voila, we've already got a pretty nice looking black and white. And um, what I'm going to do is just adjust some of these color sliders. So the way the black and white thing works, those of you that have used Lightroom would be familiar with this. It your color values are still there behind the scenes, and that's what, what all these color sliders are for. So, uh, for instance, there's a lot of um, yellow in this image, and just by bringing up this yellow value, I'm bringing up a lot of those values. Um, and it's also helping a bit with the contrast and differentiation. Uh, what I want to do, too, is, is bring the green down so that the trees are easier to see. And I'll bring that down. Oh, maybe minus 25. So there we have some uh, pretty nice contrast going. Now the other um, the other thing I want to do is to um, do a little a little capture sharpening in here. And you see, um, 
these clouds also are getting a bit too dark and we'll we'll get back to that in in a minute here but what i want to do um for sharpening we used uh precision detail before um for the clouds and um i can use it for that too but i'm also going to do some capture sharpening let me enlarge here it's pretty sharp already um you can set up presets in here too and i have some in here for sharpening what i call capture sharpening so um basically this sharpen the no aa means if you have a camera without an anti-aliasing filter which um they used to all have them um, none of my cameras do um it that's if, if you're seeing what i'm seeing which hopefully you are it's a little it's a little over sharpened but we'll take care of that in a minute remember we can always bring the layer opacity down like we did before. Um, the other thing I wanna do is I'm gonna use my little trick again with the highlights and um, bring those up here. Let me let me shrink the image down so you can see this better. Um, Cause I'm gonna use this mainly for the cloud. So in this case, um, I'll bring up uh, in the highlights, I'm gonna bring up the medium detail. Um, and this is to kind of try to bring up the clouds a bit. And then the large detail I'll bring up. Uh, uh, let's see. Highlight large detail. Let's go. Maybe something like that. So now, now we're really accentuating those clouds. Um, the whole thing is a little bit much. It's it's a little you know too much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use my overall. But I got, I like the ratio. So I'm gonna use this to just bring down the overall slider a bit okay now before i do the finishing touches my clouds my sky is a little overwhelming so i'm going to go now that i have an idea what my my sky is looking like i can go back into my basic adjustment where i have this mask where i'm blocking out the sky from any any of the um brightness changes there and what I can do is click, if you look just below this mask to the right, there's this adjust button and that brings up a whole new set of adjustments for the masking. Um, so what I'm gonna do is take the um, density up. So as you go to the right, it makes the whole thing lighter. Now the white part is already white, it can't get any lighter. So what it's gonna do is lighten up the mask on the sky. So it's gonna let some of that previous masking come through and maybe somewhere in there i want the i want the mood of the clouds i don't want to overwhelm the rest of the scene so that's pretty good right there now you may notice um kind of a halo now that we're seeing a little white edge along our mask because i've lightened the clouds um but we have some great adjustments for that. There's this thing called edge aware feather. So what it means is it'll feather the edge of the mask um, that we created. So I'll turn that on and voila, that, that white line on the edge of the mask is gone. And in fact, let me zoom in and you can see, you look along these trees, it's like magic. So we got rid of that. I'll turn it off and you can see the difference. There's that halo again. We turn this on. What it's doing, it's just feathering the edge, uh, the distinct edges on the mask. So kind of kind of another little magic feature there. So the only the only final thing, whoops, the final thing I want to do, I'm gonna close these adjustments so you can see. The final thing I want to do is just add a little more depth to the image. And let's look at the overall here. And I'll use precision contrast for that, which is I, I do this on almost every image to add a sense of depth. And in fact, I do it often enough that I actually have presets in here. So um, you see these, as you hover over it, you get the effect of the preset. Some of these are awful, but I'm gonna do the add depth landscape, my settings for that. And that just adds um, a little more pop to it. And then I can go in and tweak this if I want. So I am gonna um, change my, uh, low contrast, I'm going to bump this up a little bit, and I think I'll bump up my medium a bit. I'm going to adjust the lighting here. I, I want to bring up my midtones a little bit. So we've got 
you notice by default brings the highlights down because one of the byproducts of increasing contrast in all these three areas is that your highlights can get a little blown out so that it automatically puts in that that highlight adjustment but i'm gonna um i'm gonna take my midtones up just a little bit um the highlights yeah they look pretty good i'll just leave those i'll leave it where it was which was roughly minus 50. so again i like to use these opacity sliders so i'm i'm more likely because the ratio is important here i get the ratio the way i like it and then if i want to back off on the contrast which i do on this um not a ton but just a little bit maybe in the 70 to 80 range um voila i've got i've got a great sense of depth uh let me bring that um well let, let's just do the a b because this is my finished thing so i'm going to show you what our before and after i'll close precision contrast and we'll go to our little before and after icon here let me close it down on the left and we'll go to the full view and pretty dramatic difference. It took me a lot longer to explain it than it did to do it. Um, so once you get the hang of these things, you can do this kind of, this kind of stuff pretty quickly. And, and here we dealt with all these challenges uh, from traveling where you, you're tight on time, you can't always get the best light or the best weather. And we still ended up with some pretty nice images. So there we are. And uh, it looks like we still have some time for a few questions, which I'd be happy to answer. Uh, if you guys want to follow Joel, you can visit his website, joelwolfson.com. His blog is joelwolfson.com forward slash blog. Again, he showed you his page with all of his learning resources. He's got some great resources there. You should check it out. If you have any questions for him, you can always email him at info at joelwolfson.com. If you have questions for me or the Topaz team, you can always contact us at webinars at topazlabs.com. And you can sign up for upcoming webinars at topazlabs.com forward slash webinars. Guys, I am... Really sorry we went a little bit over time, but Joel always got some great stuff to share. And, uh, man, I, I keep you on for hours if I could. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank good. you, everyone. I appreciate you attending.